Thank you very, very much uh, for such a kind introduction. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. So, um, today, what I would like to talk to you about are a couple of work that we have done in my lab on making robots being very dexterous. Um, so what we are particularly interested in, in getting closer to the human dexterity. And I love this picture that you see here because they really illustrate the way that we manipulate objects, which is very complex. So let me let me get through this. Um, what I really particularly like is the fact that when you look at the way that we manipulate objects is that often we use the entire number of degrees of freedom we have in the hand. And what I usually do uh, on a daily basis is to pick up more than one object in a single hand, and I'm sure it's the same for you. And that's very different from what we've seen in robotics so far. So far, we usually can pick up only one object and at the fingertip at best. We hardly ever use the entire length of the finger, as we see here, or to pick up the object in between the ring and the uh, last finger, or the pinky finger. So how can we achieve this dexterity? This was a task that we set for ourselves, that we really want to exploit um, this incredible dexterity that we have in humanoid hands, those that have 16 degrees of freedom and more, um, but that are barely used so far. So I'm going to walk uh, you through the different steps that we followed to get to this stage. So we started first by observing how humans handle objects. And um, there again, I have a very nice uh, set of examples of the way that we manipulate daily objects. As you can see, it happens very frequently that we don't uh, put our finger just around the center of mass as it's traditionally done in robotics. And depending on what you want to do with the object, you may place your finger like in the picture in the middle. I hope you can see my mouse in the picture on the top middle. Typically, we have, uh, we have the finger um, at the very top of the lead to prevent the lead from opening. This is not a, such a stable optimal grasp, but it's optimal with respect to the task itself, which is to ensure that the lead does not open. Uh, at the bottom, what you see are examples also of suboptimal grasp in the sense that you're not just around the center of mass, especially for the hand at the bottom of the object on the left or in the middle, but it's optimal with respect to handing over the object to someone else. So it's been known in robotics that we place our hands on the object with respect to the function that we want to do on the object itself. While this is known, it's much less easy to generate those grasps and to be able to, uh, to go for a, a particular grasp in real time in a millisecond. So our work has been twofold. One was to generate different grasps that will resemble those human grasps, and second was to be able to retrieve those um, very rapidly uh, to be able to uh, manipulate things as we do as humans uh, extremely rapidly and pick up on the grasp in milliseconds. So we started off by generating a variety of grasp for our robots uh, by doing an optimization. So we have a model of the kinematic of the robotic hand. Here we use um, the robot iCub, which has nine degrees of freedom in its uh, finger. And we started off in simulation. We assumed that the robot could pick up just cylinder. Okay, so we then uh, task ourselves to find three contact points that will minimize the torque at the finger contact position. That's our objective function. And then we have a number of constraints, typically stability, which is force closure, uh, kinematic stability, collision avoidance. And all of this, when you solve for it, it's a nonlinear constraint based optimization. So there are advantages to do that uh, in optimization. Because it's a nonlinear constraint based optimization, you end up with a non-convex optimization, and then you have lots of feasible solution, numerous of them, which you can um, you can find by initializing your solver with different um, seeds, and that's an advantage. Why? Because then we find lots of these different solution. Here we found fifteen hundred of them. We then cluster them into fourteen classes using k-means. And we found that those classes of grass resembled those that we were looking for in the human, even though we did not prescribe the robot to have grasp that look like the human grasp. This is just out of all the feasible set of grasp on a cylinder. And observe how they resemble those different grasps that I showed you before. You see? And this is outside this notion of um, functionality of the grasp. It's just a set of feasible grasp. And imagine that you have this library of feasible grasp, then you can attach those feasible grasp to different functions. 
Now, to run this nonlinear optimization takes a long time. We're already talking about minutes. And in my view, it's absurd to run the optimization each time you want to do a RISP. Like a human, at the beginning, you learn through optimization. Like a child, you learn how to grasp objects. But after a while, uh, you have learned that and you can retrieve them. So how can we go from full optimization, searching for all possible feasible co configuration, to a learned set of those that we can retrieve in real time? Well, what we can do is that we uh, can build now a distribution of those feasible graphs. So this uh, distribution of feasible graphs is actually a distribution over the feasible posture on this simple cylinder. So think of it as a very high dimensional space. We have the hand position orientation, which are 14 dimensional, plus we have all the finger joints. Now I'm showing you here a slice of this distribution. So we could learn that we, we did this with density um, based modeling in this very high dimensional space. And here what I show is a cut in this high dimensional space. What, what you see um, highlighted uh, in, in these uh, ISO lines are the manifold of feasible grasp. How do we compute this? We simply look at the likelihood of this density, and those that are above a certain amount of likelihood um, are deemed to be feasible grasp. This distribution is known in closed form. That means that at runtime, we can decide if we are in the infeasible grasping region or the feasible grasping region. Now, assume that you start somewhere in the invisible space, which is typically before you actually grasp the object, you're far from the object. Then because you have this distribution in closed form, what you can do is a simple line search. This is super quick. Um, you can compute that in milliseconds and pick up the closest grasp, the closest to your joint configuration space. So um, observe how we can use that now uh, with a real robot. So I'll show you here a couple of examples. You'll be surprised to see that we are using here a different object at the cylinder, and that's the beauty of it, is that you can train this uh, on a very simple representation of the cylinder. This generates this feasible grasp, which are pre-shapes if you want. And once you use this pre-shape and you close on the object, you find out that you can close on many different objects. I'll show you other example here for another set of feasible grasp that we've seen before with this pre-shape. And now we can use those to close, as you can see here, on a very complex object with a nice, um, a nice uh, positioning. I particularly like uh, the example on the top, uh, sorry, on the bottom right. Um, here, observe that you have the two finger that are side by side um, to the um, to the pin of the object. Here is a screwdriver, and this is becoming one close, one step closer to the very first image that I showed you, which is to be able to pick up object by using the entire length of the finger. So this was a very first step that we did um, towards this um, this idea of exploiting the entire dexterity of the hand. Now I'm going to present to you most recent work um, in this uh, in this slide. As I said before, one thing that is absolutely amazing um, is the fact that humans can hold many objects in the hand. And this is a typical example of this dexterity. What is difficult is not just to hold the object stably um, by combining the fingers, but also to make sure that the object will not intersect with one another. So you have to place them smartly um, in, in such a way. And if you wanted to pick them, then you'll have to pick them in a certain ordering to be able to place them in the hand. So how can we approach this problem? Well, we started off first by, by saying we need to have a representation of what is reachable by each of our finger. So we need to have a model of this reachability map, which are represented here. So we go finger by finger. We have the kinematic of the hand, so it's easy to do that in simulation. We can build the sums workspace, so typically by sampling or the position of the sum. We can do the same for the index, the middle finger, and so forth. And now we can represent this uh, in closed form, similar to the density-based estimate that I presented before. Second is that we need then to find how we can pick up objects with our finger. And we revolt here to a concept that had been developed in human motion science, which is the notion of opposition space. Now, opposition space have often been studied in terms of just the finger opposing the index, middle finger, etc. Now we push this further to say, well, we want to have the opposition space over all possible fingers. 
And that's what you see here. And I know it's difficult to to look at this map. So just just take it as a you know as a as a representation, as a vague representation, that each of those entries represents now pairwise opposition across each of the phalanxes. And so you see that we go from the very trivial one, which is sum and index, to go and have a position um, between the middle finger or the ring finger and so forth. Now, once we have this, we need also to compute this self-collision map in Cartesian space to make sure that when we compute a, a motion for each of our finger, then do not uh, self-collide with one another. And we need to also have a representation that this workspace uh, may, uh, may shrink as I start moving uh, some of the finger. So how do uh, a pair of opposition uh, reduces the workspace of the other finger? I will not go through all the details of how we are solving this, but I'm going to give you a brief overview of the uh, optimization process. So again, we revolve here to full optimization first. So we have this kinematic model um, of the hand and the workspace. So we start with this, this hand reachability map. With this, then what we need to build is an algorithm that allows us to search for something that is reachable for our robotic hand, because the model that we have is for the human hand. Now we have also the kinematic of the robotic hand. We have a notion of this opposition space in the human hand, which we can then map to the opposition space in the robotic hand. And then finally, we can solve as a constraint optimization uh, space, a um, constraint optimization problem in joint space, similar to what I described at the very beginning of the talk, solving for feasible, stable, and force closure grasp, and also collision-free grasp. But now observe that what we are doing is not just for one single grasp with three contact points, but we are looking for all possible opposition um, uh, of the of the finger that will that will allow us to pick up object. This is again a nonlinear optimization problem, so it gives us multiple solution, and that's the good part of it. Similar to what I said before, this multiple solution will allow us then to choose among many different possible solution to pick up the object in the right ordering. So let's just stop now at this notion of using this opposition space to find all possible ways in which we can grasp objects. I'll show you a couple of examples of how we can do that. Here is um, uh, uh, examples of this. Here you have five different examples of how we can pick up the large ball, the tennis ball that I show here on top on the right hand side. Observe how we can recruit sometimes two fingers, sometimes three fingers, observe that these are not just the thumb and the index typically, uh, aside from one example, the second one from the left, all the other are using um, either the last uh, fingers or just uh, one single finger out of the first one. Very interesting grasp. Um, some of them uh, leave a lot of room for picking other objects, as you can observe, typically for the last one, and that leaves still the thumb and index free. So these are interesting graphs that we can reuse, uh, and I'll show you how we can do that. Now that's the solution for the large ball. Now if we change the size of the ball and we go for this soft ball, the orange one, we see that we uh, end up with different set of grasp uh, um, because of course we have to balance both the um, the position, the uh, the size of the object, and the uh, the the aperture of the of the of the pair of opposition. We go down with other balls, we see different type of grasp and so forth with small. We can do the same, um, the same type of computation for other objects, typically cylinders. Here we start with a large cylinder, and then we go our way um, through other cylinders, smaller. Um, here is a typical um, cylinder that resembles a pen. And we can go down with an even smaller cylinder, and so forth with a tiny one. Now, this library of grasp allows us now to tackle the problem that I told you at the very beginning. How can I place different objects in my hand? And the way we do it is iteratively. This is illustrated in this figure. We start by um, analyzing. Uh, I give you a first object. How can I pick it up? What are the range of um, opposition space that I can use, the range of grasp that I can use? And then once I have picked one that you will use um, the least amount of uh, contact point, of course, because I want to free many um, different fingers, and the one also that uses the least amount of my available workspace and the reachable space of my finger. 
Then I can go and pick up the second object that we see in the middle here, the little ball. And then finally, I can pick up the third object. So at the minute, we can pick up three objects, but the entire pipeline could work, of course, for more objects if we had more degree of freedom. So how does the pipeline work? So we go back to the um, schematic that I had be before. So we have this, um, this analysis for one single object, and then we repeat this for um, second object, third object, and so forth. So I'll show you here um, examples of the graphs that we've seen before and how can we use them in sequence. We start by picking up the small ball that we've seen before. We can then use the other two fingers to pick up the second ball. And now we use just the thumb to uh, pick up the small cylinder. We can do this uh, also for a larger ball with a cylinder in middle, and then a large cylinder with the thumb and index. And finally, um, this one, which we've seen uh, at the very beginning of the presentation. So um, that's, to me, is, is a ma major uh, change uh, with the way that we pick up objects in robotics traditionally. It's really at last using, as I said in introduction, this entire dexterity that we've painfully put uh, in these beautiful hands. Here it's the Allegro hand, which is 16 degrees of freedom, um, which I really find uh, as an extraordinary hand. Not only is it very fast, I haven't shown any example of, of fast control, but um, but I'll show at the very end of the, of the, of the talk how we can do that. But also, it's it's very dexterous, and there are many degrees of freedom, 16 of them, that we can use uh, pairwise. So, so I'm very happy uh, with this result, and, and I hope you, you can share some of my enthusiasm. With this, I'd I like to go one step further. Um, oh yeah, I forgot the fourth, uh, the fourth object, which we managed to also pick up, which is one more uh, example of going even beyond um, you know, some of the human dexterity. Now, now one, one step further. Um, of course, um, when, when we, we pick up objects, is not just to hold them in the hand statically, as I've shown, but it's to manipulate them. And I haven't said anything about um, controlling the object in the hand so far. I was only talking about placing the object in the hand such that you could uh, stably uh, hold them, but we are not manipulating them. As you know, usually when you pick up object, you actually then will move around your hand. Uh, and so that means that the object will move around with you and you will have to make sure that the object will not drop. When the objects are made of a single material homogeneous, um, then it's usually not too difficult to hold them in hand unless um, their, their mass distribution is inhomogeneous, as is the case with uh, typically these uh, glasses. Huh? If you move around this glass, what will happen is that the content will start floating uh, through the glass and hence the um, moment of inertia will start changing and you'll have to counterbalance force. I haven't said anything about force control, but it's obvious that force control has to come up here. Until now, I was talking only about kinematic control. Now we need to do force torque control. And to do that, of course, we need to measure force, which we can do by using pressure information that is measurable. Here we use these sensors, which are um, called biotech, can measure um, tangential normal force. So let me show you an example of, uh, of the use of, of this before I explain how we can do that. So here we are moving um, this, uh, this glass. We're just uh, generating a rotation on that glass, but that glass is filled uh, with content with rise, which is twice the weight of the actual glass. So this generates torques that we need to compensate for. To do that, we need to measure the force, as I said a minute ago. So we need to measure the tangential force and the normal forces and to see how they change as we uh, move the object um, in space. And of course, we need to use this uh, to generate the appropriate torque. Now, we want this uh, problem to be as close as possible to the reality. That means that we start off with no a priori on the shape of the object. We assume we don't know the shape uh, of the object. We don't know the weight of the object either. And we need at one time to be able to estimate it. Why do we start with this assumption? It's typically because we want uh, our, um, our grasp to be generic. Don't forget what I explained before is that we, we choose, for instance, uh, to choose different grasp on different objects based on, on very simple shape. Um, 
uh, cylinders or ball as we've seen before, but we can then generate this as pre shapes that can close an arbitrary object. So, so we don't want to know the shape of the object, we want to be able to adapt to the shape of the object upon contact, and we don't know the mass because the mass will by definition change, as in the previous example I've shown, will change as a function of the change of the content within the object. So all we know is the forward kinematic, that means the placement of my finger, and we assume here that the object are already in contact uh, with the, sorry, the fingers are already in contact with the object. So once we have the uh, position of the finger on the, uh, we have the forward kinematic, so we know where our finger lie, then we can use this to infer the position of the center of mass in real time. Typically, if we sense only normal force, then we can assume that the, um, and that the, this normal force uh, sum to zero or close to zero, that they represent force closure according to the criterion of force closure and they stabilize the object. Um, then we can infer the position of the center of mass um, uh, from this uh, simply this triangulation across the position of my three finger. If I sense tangential forces, then I can estimate that this is starting to slip, and then have an estimate also of the of the displacement of this center of mass. Now, when I do that, um, then I need to immediately adapt the finger orientation to restabilize uh, the object. And I also probably need to adapt the force that is applied by the finger um, to increase uh, the, uh, the contact force and to increase the amount of normal force to decrease the uh, slippage that I'm perceiving on the tangential force. So this is, this is what I have at my disposal. I start with this representation of the object that is given to me by these uh, contact points, these contact forces, and I build my controller based on a on a sense of how these forces change. So I estimate the frame, the frame from this uh, contact point, um, the normal um, to, the, um, to, the, uh, to the surface of my, uh, of my fingertip. I will not explain this in detail, but typically because the, um, the contact point are actually very difficult to represent. There is deformation when we're in contact with an arbitrary object. We also used, um, you know, for this machine learning, we use a neural network to estimate uh, the relationship between the deformation that we are perceiving at the fingertip. And we have actually 19 electrodes that represent um, a measurement of the, uh, the deformation at each of the fingertip. And this can be converted into a representation of the frame of the normal and the frame of the of the forces and the normal and the tangential force. So that's that's just a, a quick overview of this. Now, once we have the um, contact uh, information, then we can use the forward kinematics, as I said, to represent the object force um, and then compute now the, um, the the slippage and optimize our results. So with this um, this representation, we can at runtime adapt. Um, and of course, it's difficult to observe because here you don't see the adaptation of the force, but you can see the adaptation of the of the finger position. And these three objects are difficult um, to manipulate. The left one because it's fairly heavy for the hand; it's close to the maximum weight that the hand can hold. And the one on the right hand side is tough because we've added, as you can see here, a heavy weight. It's actually a little battery, which uh, makes um, the object twice uh, um, uh, more heavy on that side uh, than the rest. So it's a uh, non-uniform mass distribution and we can adapt uh, the grasp. Um, interesting also is to show that we can adapt um, the grasp at runtime. This is where you can observe the adaptation of the rotation of the fingertip um, on top of the adaptation of the force uh, when the object is subjected to arbitrary disturbance, as, as, we, as we see here. I'll just play the video once more. So we can generate small perturbation pushing the object um, that generates both translational and rotational displacements and have the hands uh, compensate. And, uh, rebalance the, um, the position and the weight. Finally, um, this, is, uh, this is of course my, uh, my major uh, goal in, in this work, and that's what we, we set uh, really all our efforts towards, was to be able to balance this particular complex object. It's complex because the shape itself is complex, it's complex also because the uh, object is very slippery, and because uh, finally the weight in the object is uh, three times the weight of the actual object. And so when you 
when you rotate uh, the object, the fluid here uh, generates uh, a lot of uh, changes in the uh, in the mass distribution over the object, which generates, as you can see, uh, some some form of uh, some some form of slippage or rotation of the object inside the finger, and you have to make sure that even though you allow for some of this, uh, you're still uh, keeping the object uh, within um, the force closure cone uh, of your finger. Now, lastly, for this last part of the talk, and I hope I still have time for this, um, I like to talk about one more step um, towards this human dexterity, uh, which is then to not only adapt um, to um, to, to displacement of the weight of the object as you as you are moving it, but also to be able to do what is called in-hand manipulation and to rotate your object inside the hand. So we, we took once more inspiration in the way that humans do that, and uh, we look more carefully at the way that humans uh, manipulate such object. So if you if you pay close attention, you'll see that there is a distribution of role across fingers when you do that. Um, some are used as support for the weight of the object, whereas others are used as motion generator. Right? So we have, again, I'll just play here, we have the support finger, which are the, the bottom one, and then we have the top one, which are being used to generate the rotation on the object. Now, I could... Um, yeah, I could handwrite this uh, this role distribution, or I could um, um, uh, discover it. We we took the avenue of uh, trying to discover that automatically. So we start with human demonstration. We track the motion of the finger. We uh, track the um, change in pressure information as the finger uh, move, um, uh, uh, generating this motion around the object. And of course, the combination of uh, the motion of the hand, the, the motion of the finger, and uh, the pressure sensor allows us to determine which of the finger uh, play a role as a support, uh, carry all the weights, and which uh, generate motion. So this is now a simulation of the um, tracking of those uh, uh, fingers. So the marker of each of the finger are represented here by those different um, uh, different points and uh, and uh, little uh, and you have little square, little rounds, little um, star, and each of those then uh, can uh, be extracted as a sequence of motion, which I show on the right hand side. For that, we used a uh, representation as a Markov chain, uh, so we could use whether it's called hidden Markov model that allows you to estimate first the number of underlying states in a particular uh, motion. Here in this in-hand manipulation, we can identify three states, which uh, can be uh, labeled as the uh, state during which the uh, finger contributes to support the weight, and there are stages between uh, during which they update, and they update in two sequences. They update the thumb, and then they update the um, index, typically, and the middle finger. Uh, one after the other to generate the motion. So I'm going to go through those stages in more detail for you to appreciate how we can then turn that into a control system. So if we look at just a, a close uh, motion, and here is already uh, looking at it from the standpoint of the robotic hand that we will use for control. So we uh, start in a certain configuration, and then we need to generate a motion. So to generate a motion, which is here just a simple rotation, an uh, anti-clockwise rotation, what we need to do is to move um, the thumb and the fourth finger um, in opposite manner. So you see that there is a motion from the thumb to this particular location. And now for this uh, last finger, the fourth finger, the ring finger of the allegor hand, that needs now to rotate in the uh, opposite manner. And we also need to generate a little bit of a motion of what is a support uh, finger. So this finger is probably the most challenging one because it has to both move but also uh, support most of the um, of the weight. Now um, we can schematically represent this as our four finger here to uh, act as support. They have to control and rebalance the weight, whereas uh, the other three are our. Uh, so that, whereas we have three fingers that are motion generator, and here I'm just representing it again what we need to do to control for um, this simple motion. Here we're only doing 
a small part of the, uh, the motion. The most challenging part is the one that I illustrated here, is when one of the finger has to leave the object um, to come to another posture and then apply force to generate motion. While it does so, the other finger stay put, and then once it reaches the object, then for instance here, the fourth finger has to move and then um, join the other. But as it does so, the top finger, the thumb, will actually apply pressure to generate a motion, and they will do that in uh, coordination. Here, I will focus simply on explaining the motion generation. So let's go back to our schematic. We have two support finger, and we have now the two uh, motion generator finger. To generate this lifting motion, what we use is something we've used extensively in my group, which are called dynamical system generator. These are differential equations uh, which have particular property. Um, they are stable at an attractor point, which are represented here, which is the point where we want um, the finger to reach. Now, the nice thing about this DS generator is that it's very flexible. Um, so we'll see that in the next video, is that it will always recover from perturbation and be able to come back to its attractor, even if it's pushed away uh, from its core. So once we have this, then there are an infinite number of trajectories we can follow, and here is one of them, depending on where we are, that will lead us to um, this attribute. So we have such a DS generator for each of our finger, and that allows us to generate the motion to the desired next point. Now we can sequence them through this HMM and have this sequencing of motion. So this leads to this um, nice um, uh, demonstration. So we see that we can uh, rotate the objects inside the finger, have this nice sequencing and coordination. I mentioned coordination, but I haven't explained how we coordinate. So let me first explain to you why coordination is crucial. Imagine that I start with this motion generator that I presented before. I move a finger and boom, um, it's intersecting. And the second finger goes and moves with a sequential temporal sequence without waiting for the first finger, the thumb here, to reach the object. What happens is that obviously the object falls. So we need to have a coordination and we need to make sure that this coordination is embedded in the controller. I'll go very quick. We can do that in closed form. This is extensive work also of my lab that I will not go um, through detail, but as opposed to use two separate DCS generator, one for um, the finger and denoted here by X and one for the finger denoted by Y, we can make sure that they are coupled and in dynamical system control, that means that each of the variables becomes a codependency uh, to the other dynamical system. We can prove that these two uh, systems, once coupled, will both reach the attractor um, uh, asymptotically um, in sequences. I will not go through the, uh, through the proof here. So once we have this, then we can um, generate uh, all sorts of very nice uh, robustness against perturbation. I'll show you here a couple of examples. You can stop one finger, you can move the object. Um, as you move the object, you simply move the attractor, but uh, the system remains coupled to this different attractor. And so um, you have this, uh, this nice uh, preservation and robustness to uh, both the displacement of the object and the displacement of the finger in coordination. With this, um, I'll, uh, uh, this will be the end of my talk. I'll just give you a very, very brief overview of other work that we do in the lab, which we'll not have time to discuss in detail. Um, we have uh, done extensive work um, on manipulating uh, deformable objects, um, typically fruits and vegetables, learning from demonstration, um, using uh, here also uh, computer vision to be able to extract uh, changes and that are generated on the object to generate different motion. We've done it also for um, for different uh, fruits, as we see here, then typically for uh, uh, scooping melons. Now, the interesting part when you do that for these vegetables is that no two vegetables are the same. Now, we see other examples. A lot of work that we've done uh, was on extremely fast computation for catching objects uh, in flight. Uh, we've done many different examples of this, which were then ported for bimanual coordination with humans, as we see in this example, having a flexibility and adaptability of um, bimanual uh, motion of the two arm and also bimanual coordination of forces. Um, 
which we then uh, used also for uh, generating uh, typically handover uh, motion from a robot to uh, a human, um, adapting to the motion of the human, adapting also to the pressure uh, applied on the hands. This is a coordination between uh, hand closure, finger closure, and motion of the arm to enable uh, the robot to adapt to uh, both the uh, motion of the human and the motion of the arm. And of course, we, we've also looked at many other interesting problems in robotics, which are navigation, be it navigation of uh, wheel-based platform, as we see on the right-hand side uh, for navigating in crowd, or uh, navigating a human robot in coordination with a human. And perhaps the one that I loved most, which I'm highlighting here in the middle, is this one where we it's a bit similar to what I presented for the hands. It's here using the entire number of degrees of freedom of a human robot to go down and, and pick up objects and, and lift them. Um, so uh, balancing um, the, uh, the force to, uh, to, to stabilize the object as well as exploiting the entire um, dexterity of the full body control. With this, um, I want to close the talk. I want to thank first uh, Kenpan Yao, who uh, has done all the work, the beautiful work that I presented here on um, picking up uh, multiple objects inside a hand, and Farshad Kadiva, who did uh, the wonderful work on um, balancing uh, the weight of an object uh, in hand and the in-hand manipulation that I presented. The work that you've seen is all documented on our website. Uh, we have a source code for most of the uh, of the control system that we developed. We have tutorials. We also have all the publication and the videos that are freely available. And I also want to thank um, the number of people who are behind the many different videos that I've shown at the very end. With this, uh, I would love to answer your question if there are any, and uh, I'll, I'll close here. Uh, I'll ask the chair if the chair wants me to stop the full screen. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for, let's uh, give her a round of applause. Yeah, for excellent uh, presentations. Yeah, it's a little tricky. We have uh, quite a few people uh, on site and we also have a lot of people online. Um, I like to give equal opportunities to both uh, groups of audience. So maybe we can begin with the people on site uh to just ask a question or two yeah any questions from the audience here yeah just sign hey professor uh Bilad, it's a uh, great work uh my question is uh, if you want to grasp a very strong ship it's very strong the robert never seen that that ship and uh, i mean if you want to grasp it and the finger should move in a uh, special, uh, in a special pattern or special sequence. I mean, to get this pattern or sequence is uh, is uh, based on the computer real time uh, uh, computation, or it's better to use a human use uh, like a demonstration to to show how to grasp it. Uh, which one currently is uh, in your life? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so. The, it's it's difficult to say. Um, I, I think using the human as a, as a as a source of inspiration is important in my view, but it stops there. It's really essentially a source of inspiration. Um, what what we I mean the road that we followed was then to turn that into a, an actual optimization, where we can learn uh, ourselves for the kinematic of the robotic hand. You know. Usually the robot hand is not exactly the same as the human hand. So it's not as if you can easily port what you've seen in the human to the robot itself. You can you can take inspiration in the sense that, okay, here are the typical complex grasp that the human can do. But now what are you know what are the range of feasible grasp that uh, this particular hand with this particular kinematic, also with this particular dynamics, because the robotic hand will have different dynamics, will have different strengths across the fingers, different from the human. There are things that you have in the robotic hands which are better than the human hand and other things that are less good. Um, give you an example. Usually in the robotic hands, um, the length of the finger, um, maybe I'll share screen once more. Why don't I do that? Um, so uh, not in full screen mode. Um, so let me just go back and uh, share to 
I like that. But what I mean to say is that the um, fingers in the human hand have um, different lengths. Uh, so typically what we call the pinky is smaller and the, um, uh, okay, there is a screen overlaid. I don't know if it's the same for you. Um, the, the pinky finger will be much smaller, the thumb will be smaller, and then the, uh, you know, the middle and, and the other two finger index are about the same size. Most robotic hands have actually identical lengths of the finger. So the mapping is not that easy. Um, and that's, that's, that's a weakness, um, but it's also a strength uh, because that's why it's easy for us. If I, if I go back to, um, to, the, um, to this, um, the very first example that I showed when, we're, when we grab all the different objects, um, we, can, we can pick up objects here you see between these two fingers as well as, as let's say the see the index and the middle finger or the uh, ring finger and the middle finger in that robotic hands actually identical there is no difference between those because they have the same length they have the same number of degrees of freedom um they are also moving the same way so so this is a long answer to a short question so i'll, I'll just summarize um, human inspiration, yes. Um, mimicry, no. Uh, I think uh, we have to still exploit the strengths and the weaknesses of each of the hands um, in such a way that we can do with the robotic hands uh, as dexterous motion as humans, but possibly in a different way. Okay, good. So uh, maybe I'll give an opportunity to somebody online. Uh, you can either type your question in the chat box or, or you can just open your, your, your microphone and, and shout. Anyone? Yeah, so go ahead. Can I ask a question? Yes. Uh, yeah. So, Professor Bilat, thank you for your uh, very interesting, inspiring talks. So, I have been seeing that you had worked on the um, coordination of the, uh, the dexter hands, the fingers. Also, I see you have some current work with the coordination of the bimanual arms. So, uh, my question is how do you see in the future the coordination of the arm and the hand? And also, in particular, the bimanual arms and hands. Yeah. Yes. Thank you for the question. So we we have uh, also uh, looked at that. I think it's extremely important. Um, the 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 way that we've proceeded um, was to. Uh, it's been shown very briefly um, through the. Uh, just if I just go back to the. Uh, handover um, video that I showed extremely briefly at the very end. So what we, uh, let me just, uh, maybe I should uh, share screen differently because that's too slow this way. Um, if, you, if you pay attention, I'm gonna stop all those videos and just uh, uh, show you the one I'm catching up. So uh, for this one, we looked extensively at, at the coordination. It's absolutely crucial. If you pick up uh, and catch objects like this, you need to coordinate the closure of your finger uh, with the uh, with the actual motion of the arm, um, so we have a temporal uh, coordination, and and this is similar when when you when you pick objects here uh, from a human uh, to the robot. Now there are differences between these two coordination. Um, typically, here we have a sort of a, um, you know, a leader follower type of coordination. If you observe the, um, this, you'll see that as soon as the object is put in the hands, then the robot arm stops. That means that as soon as we perceive um, that we place uh, an object and that there is there is, there is you know force applied on the hands, then the hand closes, and as soon as the hand closes, then the arm stops. Um, and so, so this coordination can be built. Um, for this, we use also dynamical system control, and we use a coupling between the two with a codependency, but where the leading um, leading system is the hands and the dependent system is the arm. When, when you look at this other video where the two arms are coordinated, this is also a coupling. You have here a coupling between um, the two arms. They are here coupled to move in synchrony, similar to the finger coupling that I've showed before. Now we have never done what you're suggesting, which is to couple now two um, hands and all the fingers in the hands with the two arms. It would be possible. There is nothing that prevents it. We haven't taken the time. I don't think that 
there is any novelty to that because it would be essentially putting together things that we've developed um, uh, so far, but it's totally uh, feasible. Possibly what could be novel and interesting is if this co-adaptation had to uh, work also in force and torque control, which I haven't touched upon so much. Um, clearly, um, we may have uh, to think about how to rebalance the forces across the two arms and possibly also changes uh, the finger configuration um, in, in synchrony to this rebalancing of the force across the two arms. Uh, that, that is something that could be quite interesting because that will call for possibly extending this notion of the um, of the feasible grasp on the workspace to the arm and hand as opposed to just compute it now uh, for the for the fingers. Okay, maybe... and and also to take into account force. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'll stop. Here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Right, maybe it's uh, the on onside audience turn. Anybody else? Yeah, we do have uh, a few minutes, uh, which is good. Uh, hello, hi. Uh, can you hello. hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So uh, you were talking about bio biomimicry and also how uh, uh, anthropomorphic hands, they might not be just completely replicated in the same way that, uh, I mean, the control methods that we have for humans should not be replicated for robots. Uh, what about the construction just uh, trying to emulate human hands by creating anthropomorphic robots. Uh, do you think that in the future, let's say five, 10 years from now, we will still have uh, robots still being created with anthropomorphic hands? Or do you think that maybe there is a design that uh, will eventually transition out of anthropomorphic and have only two or three fingers? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so. So, you know, um, anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic hands uh, make total sense when, when you want to design um, processes. Uh, so in that sense, I think there will still be quite a lot of work um, on that. And uh, so far, processes have only five degrees of freedom usually. Um, so uh, in comparison, when you think uh, of the Allegro or the iCub hand that I've shown here, they have much more degrees of freedom, but they are very bulky and heavy. So I believe that there will still be tremendous amount of work to be done on, on reducing the size and the weight of those dexterous anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic hands um, to use them as, as, as processes. There are also advantages uh, to use a anthropomorphic hands if you want a robot to interact and work with humans because it's probably um, easier for the humans to predict what the robot uh, will be doing and because it has this image of the of the of the what the hand uh, with the capability of the hand um but when it comes down to pure robot control yes i would love to see people think about different type of hands um, not just gripper um not just um, no, three finger you could actually put more fingers uh, what i would love to see and i don't know if you see my video but i would love to see also hands that can pick up object from 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 uh, front and and below um I have also, um, I don't have them here, that's too bad, but I had a couple of uh, drawings that uh, I had uh, someone make for me uh, of a hand with two thumb, because the thumb is so dexterous, it's a wonderful, um, you know, kinematic. We have only one and it makes our hand very asymmetric and leaves us with the pinky and, and ring finger that barely do anything. Um, why don't we have two thumbs, you know, as opposed to one pinky and a thumb? And that would increase enormously the dexterity. And that's something that we see in, in if you if you are familiar with the work on uh, done by Etienne Burdet, uh, who studies the population of humans that have uh, six fingers, they're they born with six fingers, then they manage to use some of the fingers with the dexterity of the thumb and index and some of the uh, the pinky and the and the additional finger that they have. So yes, we could think of having hands that are non-anthropomorphic, that have much more fingers or less fingers, especially also fingers that move different ways. Um, 
And that doesn't, you know, that doesn't apply just to hands. Think of robotic arms. They're all similar. You see one more company coming up. Again, another seven degrees of freedom arm, exactly the same as all the one that we've seen before. We lack tremendously imagination in terms of uh, mechanical design. So, um, I, you know, I, I love the question. Thank you very much. And I hope that uh, we'll see more design that are going beyond uh, anthropomorphism uh, for, for robotic purposes. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. So maybe I can slip in a question myself. Uh, yeah, so you, you, you haven't really touched too much on the perception side of the problem. I, I see you re rely heavily on motion capture. You have a bit of uh, tactile sensing. So can you just comment quickly on the challenges that are facing the perception of uh, dexterous manipulation? Uh, yeah, thank you, Zeno. Um, so, um, <laughs> but you know, when, when you do in-hand manipulation, I, I believe that the perception you really care about is, is tactile sensor is for stock sensor and we do use them extensively. And whereas vision, it's it's probably much less important um, because once you have the object in hand, um, basically it's it's obstructed. Um, you, you know, you barely see it, especially when it's a, it's a tiny object. So so vision is, is there um, as it is for humans. It's there to allow you to identify the shape, to give you prior uh, on, on the possibly uh, the shape, the weight and, and the um, uh, and the texture, uh, so the friction coefficient. Uh, but once you pick the object, then you're left with adapting, especially when you pick it up and you move it in the air and you have to adapt to what you're perceiving. So you could use vision also as a complement if vision was fast enough, that's true, and it would be very useful. Uh, and also if your vision was very robust um, uh, to be able to to, to pick up, uh, you know, slippage, for instance, from, from seeing only partial view of the object, uh, especially when it's a small object. So you need to be very quick at perceiving that to be able to separate the object from the hand, all of that. We're not computer vision experts, so that's the reason why we use uh, OptiTrack Marker. Um, um, it's, it's, a, it's a field of its own. Um, but whenever there is some state-of-the-art computer vision, we do use it. In truth, so far, uh, we found that um, it was very slow, um, too slow for the type of in-hand manipulation that we're doing. Um, so that's the reason why we haven't used it uh, so much um, in this work. Um, but if there were people interested in collaborating with us on this, uh, I, I definitely would be extremely interested in that. OK, so uh, maybe one more question, either from uh, audience here or online. There's Could I have a very short question? Go ahead. Uh, this is Zidong. I'm really interested in you know, how to do in, in hand manipulation spare human beings skill. So uh, you, you mentioned that they have a lot of grasping poles. So how do you commence the robotic skill different or similar with the human beings grasping? Um... It was by chance. Um, you know, um, in fact, um, the... So at the very beginning, the, when, when I showed this uh, similar grasp uh, between the, the, the humanoid hand and the, uh, the human hand, um, this was not by design, but because if, if you want, it was not by design in the objective function and the, uh, the constraint-based optimization controller, but it's unsurprising because the, uh, the hand of the iCub is very similar to the human hand. It's similar both in size um, uh, as well as the as the placement of the finger, especially for the thumb, which is quite close to to the motion of the of the human thumb, and and for the, all the other uh, other fingers. So it's it's quite unsurprising that we end up with a set of feasible grasp that resemble uh, very much the human one. Um, I did not show that here, but we did the exact same optimization process for a three-finger um, typical robotic hand. Um, this was the Barrett hand, which has, um, which has, uh, you know, opposing finger. I cannot really do it with my hands, but you have uh, really fingers that can move around um, a circle with 360 uh, degrees um, rotation. Well, 180 actually for for each of the of them, and they can um, really have a completely um, a symmetric distribution and with uh, with with the three finger are, are around a circle and there you end up also with lots of feasible interesting uh, amusing uh, grass but they be no relationship whatsoever to the uh, human hands type of grasp um, so so that depends very much on the kinematic of the hand similar kinematic 
uh, will lead to a uh, similar uh, feasible posture. Uh, dissimilar kinematic will lead to uh, other type, uh, but still a range of them, uh, other type of feasible posture on the object. So I hope it, it answers your question. Yeah. Okay, so with that, I think we are out of time. So uh, yeah, please uh, join me in uh, thanking Professor Pilar for a very insightful and entertaining talk. So thank you very much.